Those of you who grew up playing Championship or Football Manager or similar video games will most likely be familiar with the concept of taking a football club from nothing, building it up from the ground and watching it grow until they are able to compete against the very best. I remember one game called Let's Make a Soccer Team on the PlayStation 2, which appeared to have been created by people who only had a very fleeting understanding of football, where you literally played as the owner and chairman, and, well, unsurprisingly, given the game's title, created your own football club. That game, at least, as far as I can recall, had been rather clumsily adapted from a popular video game in Japan, and was pretty terrible. But on Football Manager, I used to take the quest of taking a team from zero to heroes pretty seriously, often going to the extent of going into the game's editor database and creating some kind of Alpha AFC in my own image. But then again, I always was a dreadful narcissist. Clearly, I am not alone though, both in being a dreadful narcissist, of course, and in having done that. As a little while ago, someone got in touch with me and asked if I could make a video about why billionaires tend to buy fairly established football clubs rather than building a minnow or brand new club up from the ground. Initially, with respect, I thought that it seemed like a bit of a daft question. I mean, why would billionaires buy non-league football clubs? They are far too busy buying up media corporations, trying to fire themselves into outer space, and posting memes on social media in a sad but desperate bid to be liked. Wherever would they find the time, therefore, to take Havens and Waterlooville from the National League South to the Premier League? especially when you factor in all of those trips to Jeffrey Epstein's island. But then I started to think about it, about the pipe dream of building a club up from nothing that I and no doubt plenty of others had as a child, and the fact that for literal billionaires, that wouldn't be a pipe dream at all. It would be very much attainable. Then I thought about the sense of ruthless ambition and the enormous egos that some billionaires have, especially those who relish the limelight, and I started to think, just like that subscriber, yeah, hang on a minute, why don't billionaires buy or start their own non-league football teams? That seems like just the kind of thing that some of them would do. So naturally, I had no other option but to make an entire video positing that idea, looking to understand the psychology of why billionaires actually buy football clubs in the first place, and whether it would be fun to see them buy your local village team and turn them into Champions League contenders, or whether it would be quite joy-sapping and dystopian if that actually were to happen. The first point that I want to address is how easy it would actually be for a billionaire to buy a non-league football team and to climb their way up through the divisions. The answer to that, I think, is that it would actually be quite easy. Assuming that they had at least some idea of what they were doing, and appointed semi-competent operators to carry the project out. I think that it is absolutely feasible that, just supposing Mark Zuckerberg wanted a break from harvesting all of our data and giving testimony before the US Congress, so he decided to take over Chipping Sodbury Town FC of the Hellenic League. Admittedly, this is the hardest premise to initially buy into, but just stay with me. Assuming that good old Zuckers did that, I do think it is very probable that he could take them from step 9, which is the level that they currently play at, all the way to the Premier League. It's not a bad idea that actually. Gloucestershire have only got a couple of EFL teams and none in the top two divisions, so there is certainly a gap in the market. You're welcome, Mark. Bizarrely, and I had to edit this bit in, despite me picking Chipping Sodbury out at absolute random, and the town having a population of just 5,000 people, it turns out that there are two actual billionaires from there. James Dyson, founder of Dyson Limited, who lives in the nearby Doddington Park, an enormous stately home that was built by slave owners, and Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling, who was born at the Chipping Sodbury Maternity Hospital and lived locally until the age of four. This is a massive tangent, admittedly, but what are the chances of that? I pick a random billionaire and a random tiny town in Gloucestershire, and it turns out that the second and 202nd richest Britons happen to have close ties to the town. I feel a bit daft for picking Zuckerberg and not one of them now. I bet he's never even heard of Chipping Bloody Sodbury. 
I know I hadn't until about five minutes ago. The point being, a billionaire could quite easily guide a team from step 8, 9 or 10 of the English Football League pyramid up to the Football League and, I think, even the Premier League. We have seen multi-millionaires do it at clubs like Fleetwood Town, reaching the Football League, that is, not the Premier League, as well as even more emphatic examples from overseas. It is eminently doable precisely because in the modern game, wage expenditure and league finishes correlate so strongly that at the beginning of any given season, you can almost predict how a league table will shape up at the end of the season based upon that criteria alone. In four out of Europe's top five leagues this season, the team with the highest wage bill won the division. And that pattern continues if you look at the teams that qualified for Europe, finished in mid-table, and were relegated. There are, of course, a couple of under and overachievers each season, Brentford perhaps being the most notable from the Premier League this season, meanwhile Manchester United, continue to prove that if you try hard enough, you can still bugger it up and be an exception to the rule. But by and large, over time, you're standing within any given league or league system, and the amount of money that you spend on paying your players will align very evenly indeed. So I don't think that it is the impossibility of the size and scale of the challenge that is convincing Bill Gates to stay away from buying Beverly Town FC. I mean, admittedly, I haven't asked him, but I would be fairly surprised. Rather than asking why billionaires don't buy non-league football teams though, we should start by asking why do they buy football teams at all? I would argue that there are three main reasons. One, money. They're simply seeking profit and or asset diversification. Two, politics. Either to extend their political reach and contacts, change the perception of them or the institution that they represent, or to gain legitimacy and affection, often referred to as sports washing. And, very often, a combination of all of the above. And three, an actual passion for and interest in football. Of course, two or even three of those factors can all intertwine. It is perfectly possible for some despot, dictator or warlord with more than a billion dollars to have a genuine interest in football, or for someone whose primary motivation is making even more money to still be a football fan and to enjoy the ride. And it's even possible that some Western Asian royal might find that football is not just a great investment in terms of laundering their and their country's reputations, but that it can also be a very shrewd financial investment, and particularly good in terms of diversification. As you could well argue, has been the case at Manchester City, who Sheikh Mansour and his City Football Group acquired for just £210 million in 2008. The club is now valued as being worth £3.37 billion. However, you can also see why all three motivations are unlikely to lead any one of the world's more than 2,500 billionaires straight into taking on the challenge of buying a non-league team. In the first instance, so those motivated primarily by money, first and foremost, just because buying a team in the Premier League or in Europe's other top flights, outside of a handful of genuine super clubs such as Manchester City now, it isn't actually very expensive. Newcastle United, for example, sold for just £300 million this season, despite having been in the Premier League for the last five years, having a large stadium, and among the largest domestic fan bases in the division. That is less than the amount that it would cost you to buy the cheapest NFL or even MLS team. And it means that an individual Saudi royal paid more for a piece of art in 2016 than his entire family, and indeed country, paid to acquire a Premier League football team. So, it is not like that there is any great incentive for billionaires at least to go out in search of a cheaper option and to create a lot more unnecessary hard work for themselves. The challenge of getting Newcastle United into the Premier League top four or top six is a relatively modest one when compared with trying to do likewise at Yeovil Town, Woking or even nearby Gateshead. I think that there is an argument that if you were purely motivated by extracting every pound of possible profit out of an operation and you did things right, perhaps you could make more by buying a non-league team for effectively nothing and taking them all the way to the Premier League. But you would be looking at a much longer time frame, of course, 
and you would be taking on far greater risk for the sake of maybe, and it would be a speculative assessment, 50 to 150 million pounds at the very most, which is peanuts to a lot of these people. In any investment that is driven purely by profit, which is most investments, of course, risk is a very significant consideration. And reducing risk, whilst maximizing profit, tends to be the sole aim of the game. So, there aren't just more negatives than positives, from that perspective, to buying a non-league or even lower league team. In terms of the practicalities, you have also got to think about how you are actually going to build the club up. It is not necessarily a case of, build it and they will come. If you were to take ownership of Alston Football Club in Cumbria, for example, in a town of barely a thousand people and with no major towns or cities for miles around, the closest probably being Carlisle, that already has a fairly popular football club with locals, even if you were to become the best team in all of Europe, you're probably going to do well to attract crowds of more than 10,000. Unless you were to build your own high-speed rail network, connecting the rest of England to your ground. In which case, it is unlikely to be a profitable endeavour, whatever happens on the pitch. That is, of course, a very extreme example, but it is hard to gain support as an unestablished football club. Milton Keynes Dons were founded almost 20 years ago now, in the largest settlement, and now city, in all of Buckinghamshire, which has a population of more than half a million people. Buckinghamshire, that is, not Milton Keynes. Although, Milton Keynes is still pretty big. Yet, even in a stadium which can accommodate more than 30,000 fans, and in a season in which they almost won promotion from League One, MK Dons still had an average of fewer than 10,000 fans at their home games this season. That is less than half the average attendance at Ipswich Town this season, despite Ipswich having a smaller stadium, fewer than half as many inhabitants as Milton Keynes, and finishing 11th in League One this season. Because Ipswich are 143 years old. They have generational support behind them, something which cannot be bought or gained overnight. Even Manchester City, who were among the best supported teams in England, even before Sheikh Mansour bought them in 2008, are still miles behind the likes of Liverpool and Manchester United when it comes to domestic and international support, despite being the most successful team in English football over the past decade. As for groups two and three, it makes absolutely no sense for someone who is politically motivated and particularly those who are in search of a rapidly laundered reputation and hordes of adoring football fans to buy a non-league team. Newcastle United and Manchester City had among the largest fan bases in England before being bought by Royals or states in the Middle East. And Chelsea were also one of the biggest teams in the country before Roman Abramovich arrived, despite some of the teasing that all three of those team supporters get. In fact, if you look at owners in that second bracket, they almost all target very large teams because no other teams would capably serve their purposes. As for Group 3, billionaires who are actually passionate about football, often they are passionate about a specific club that they support and, invariably therefore, it is that club that they want to buy, own and help to develop. So, you have got the likes of Tony Bloom at Brighton, Matthew Benham at Brentford and Delia Smith at Norwich. Not all billionaires, of course, but you get the idea. So the only billionaire who is ever likely to buy a non-league football club is either one who is so ham-fisted that they won't spend as much money on a Premier League team as they would on a piece of art, or even as much on a Championship or League One team as they would on a week away with the kids. Or one who is passionate about football but is unable to buy the club that they actually support, presumably because the existing owner is unwilling to sell up, or because they are looking to buy a football club that competes in a market outside of the one that the team they actually support competes in. And they really, really want a project. I am making it sound extremely unlikely, but it is not as though it has never happened. In 2009, Austria's wealthiest person, Dietrich Meitschitz, who is worth an estimated $26 billion, bought non-league German outfit, SSV Mark Randstedt, who competed in Germany's regional fifth tier at the time through his private company Red Bull. Mike Schitz 
was only actually interested in acquiring Mark Rangstedt's league license so that he wouldn't have to start out at the absolute foot of the German Football League pyramid. And he immediately did away with Mark Rangstedt's name, colours, and all of the club's tradition. Instead, he plastered the name Red Bull onto everything and mimicked his company's colours, just as he had already done at Red Bull Salzburg. Except, unlike in Salzburg, he couldn't actually rename Mark Rindstad as Red Bull Leipzig due to DFB rules around football clubs not being allowed to include corporate names. Instead, therefore, Meitschitz renamed SSV Mark Rindstad as Rasen Ball Sport Leipzig, frequently shortened to just RB Leipzig, nicknamed them the Red Bulls and renamed the Zentralstadion as the Red Bull Arena. Meitschitz didn't actually buy SSV Mark Rindstad because he wanted to take on the challenge of taking a club all the way from the 5th to the 1st year of German football, but simply because no teams at any higher levels would sell to him. He and Red Bull had spent years trying to buy an established German football club, such as Sachsen Leipzig, Chemie Leipzig, St. Pauli, 1860 Munich, Fortuna Dusseldorf, and Lokomotiv Leipzig, focusing most of their efforts on struggling East German outfits who they hoped would be more receptive to their ideas and bids. In each and every instance, once Red Bull's intentions became clear, that is, to fully rebrand the club, just as they had done in Salzburg, fierce supporter backlash scuppered any chance of a deal being struck. It took them more than three years and at least six sets of negotiations failing before they finally settled for a fifth-tier team because no one at any level above that wanted to become a marketing ploy for a company that sells fizzy, sugary energy drinks that act as a laxative and stop you from being able to sleep for a week. Or is that just me? We do also see it, typically on a much smaller scale than Leipzig, who are a pretty extreme example and are now one of the three or four best teams in the Bundesliga, competing to finish second each season, in England, Scotland, Spain, and indeed just about everywhere. It is extremely prevalent in the Highland and Lowland leagues up in Scotland where you have had some teams in recent years bankrolled by multi-millionaires, signing players from Scottish League One or even Scottish Championship teams, such were the wages that they were offering for these players to come and play in pub car parks and school playing fields most weeks. In the Spanish League system, you have got FC Andorra, who competed in the fifth tier of Spanish football when Gerard Piquet bought the club during the 2018-19 season. But has just won promotion to the Segunda Division, or La Liga 2 this season, the second tier of Spanish football. In the English League system, National League side Wrexham AFC were recently bought by Hollywood actors Ryan Reynolds and the other one whose name I always forget, and though they failed to win promotion this season after finishing second and losing to Grimsby Town in the playoff semi-finals, you suspect that it is only a matter of time given the scale of their investment relative to the league that they are playing in. Admittedly, all of those examples are owned by multi-millionaires rather than fully reptilian billionaires, but the concept is still the same. That was a joke, by the way, the reptilian bit, before all the billionaire simps and Elon Musk stands come after me in the comments. There are examples of some other actual billionaires, though. Peter Lim bought 50% of Salford City in 2014, shortly after the club won promotion, to the seventh tier of English football, joining co-owners Gary Neville, Phil Neville, Ryan Giggs, Nicky Butt, and Paul Scholes, who each owned 10% of the club alongside him. Salford reached the FL in 2019, following enormous investment by non-league standards, both on and off the pitch. Though, Lim's ownership stake has since been reduced to 40% due to David Beckham acquiring a 10% interest in the League 2 team. Back in Germany, 1899 Hoffenheim probably provides the most extreme example anywhere in the world, at least as far as I'm aware, of a billionaire bankrolling a football club from nothing to the top flight during the modern era. Hoffenheim is literally a village, which has a population of just 3,000 people. Hoffenheim are a village football club, therefore. And when billionaire Dietmar Hopp first decided to invest in his local village club, following a particularly devastating defeat in 1990, their league status reflected that fact. 
Hoffenheim competed in the Kreisliga, the lowest level of football in the German pyramid which covers steps 8 through to 14. By the end of the decade, Hoffenheim had climbed all the way from the 8th to the 5th tier, and during the mid-2000s, Hopp's investment stepped up a notch as he publicly set his sights on the seemingly unthinkable target of reaching the Bundesliga. It took just three years, masterminded by Ralf Rangnick, for Hoffenheim to do it, and in 2009, Hopp built a 30,000 plus seater stadium for a football club that, I will remind you, represents a village of 3,000 people. The stadium isn't actually in Hoffenheim anymore, it is in the nearby town of Sinsheim, but even the population of Sinsheim is only 35,000. Despite having finished as high as third and fourth in the Bundesliga in recent years, and having had famous European nights against the likes of Liverpool and Manchester City, only last place Greuther Fürth had a lower average attendance than Hoffenheim in the Bundesliga this season, as they averaged just 12,190 fans inside of the 30,150 capacity Rhein-Neckar Arena. That reflects the difficulties that I spoke about earlier on, of actually building a fan base when you build a football club up from the ground, regardless of success. Hopp is reported to have invested 350 million euros into Hoffenheim, and in return, he has become one of the most hated figures in all of German football, thought to have artificially inflated the standard and standing of a plastic football club. And he is frequently taunted, ridiculed, and abused by opposition fans, many of whom view him as almost the personification of the commercialization of football and a physical embodiment of the notion of buying success in football rather than earning it. But the reality is, almost all success in football now is bought. Sure, Bayern Munich are a footballing institution in Germany with one of the largest fan bases and trophy cabinets in world football. But the reason that they are still so successful is because they spend by far the most money and have by far the best players of any German football club. In modern football, it doesn't matter how well you run a club, you cannot win the Premier League title with a championship budget. And you cannot hope for sustained success unless you bring your wage expenditure in line with the level at which you intend to compete. And that, surely, is the biggest problem. Football clubs should not be dependent upon the whims of billionaires by whatever motive they decide to take over your club, and you shouldn't need a sugar daddy by necessity to climb the football league pyramid. It wasn't always thus, or at least, it wasn't always thus to this extent. There was a time when the likes of Tottenham and Derby County could win promotion from the second division and win the first division title during their first season up as newly promoted teams, without significantly altering their level of investment. During the Premier League era, we have had one genuinely remarkable title-winning team only, Leicester City, in 2016 of course, and even they had spent heavily by championship standards and spent around £70 million in the two summers following promotion before they won the league. It was still absolutely remarkable, please do not get me wrong, and I doubt we will see the like of it again until something radical changes in terms of the structure of the game. But it does just go to show how the role of money in the game has changed over the last 20, 30, and 40 years. And how it has put football clubs, certainly in England, almost entirely at the behest of extremely wealthy and often rather unsavoury characters. What's more, this situation isn't, as some people suppose, entirely inevitable. In the case of billionaires who buy football clubs to extract money out of them whilst owning them and then to sell them for a massive profit, clearly those clubs would be better off being owned by the fans or some kind of supporters' trust. Lots of people seem to have this notion that a fan-owned Manchester United, for example, wouldn't be able to spend as much money as they do now, when, in fact, they could spend a lot more since they wouldn't have to send the Glazers hundreds of millions of pounds to service the debts that they used to buy the club, just as the likes of Real Madrid and Bayern Munich, who are also fan-owned and generate enormous revenue, do not have that wealth extracted by a billionaire several thousand miles away. But... I should stop because I am in danger of drifting off topic and 
on to a topic that I have talked about at length many times on this channel in the past. Ultimately, billionaires don't tend to buy non-league football teams because they rarely run parallel to the reasons why they want to buy football clubs in the first place. And in the very rare circumstances when they do, while success on the pitch is very attainable, if you hire the right people and invest a fat wad of cash, success off it is rather more difficult. And you are liable to become far more disliked than if you had just bought an already established club. Funnily enough, I do think that if one billionaire had taken over a non-league team years ago and had done reasonably well with it, loads of them probably would have followed in their footsteps. Do you know what I mean? You can just imagine non-league football being turned into a pissing contest between shallow and increasingly balding men whose primary motive wouldn't be money, politics or passion, but just one-upping Elon, Jeff, Larry and Bill. They would probably plaster their company names all over the place, and in the club's name, just like Mike Chitz has done, at a whole load of clubs. And we would have Tesla, Torquay United, Amazon, Aldershot Town, and Virgin, Curzon Ashton, all vying for the Premier League title every season. Following their four or five straight promotions, meanwhile Manchester United and Liverpool are now fighting it out for survival in League One due to their refusal to rename themselves, and there are no actual fans there anymore, even actual Curzon Ashton fans got bored of it, the games are just broadcast on the metaverse, and only the owners that have bought the necessary NFTs to be granted access to watch the game tune in, which is just the owners, forcing football fans to take up an interest in another sport, until a massive asteroid comes and finally puts us out of the sordid misery that we have got ourselves into. Thinking about it, it's probably a good thing that more billionaires don't mind on league teams. Sounds awful. That is it for today's video. Thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. I sincerely hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. Um, hate is always appreciated, even death threats. Um, as I always say, just uh, positive interactions. That's what we like to see. Probably good for the algorithm or something. Make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC Sam's. And you can also find me on social media, uh, on Twitter or Instagram via the username at HITC Sam's on both. You can also send abuse on there, but I do prefer it in the comments if possible. Thank you and have a truly wonderful day.